was a real estate agent for 12 years, right? I did Million Dollar Listing New York Bravo for 10 years and all the spinoffs. And I went to every other real estate brokerage under the sun and said, I have a team of 65. We do a billion a year. This is 2017. I think I should switch firms. A lot of people ask me, how much of the show is real? Melissa McGrath, a newer agent, was in the office, now has her first $7.85 million listing, all thanks to a guy who finished the show, literally got into his Ferrari, drove to our office, and said, I want to list with Sirhan. Are you that? You come do it. And then there you go. And we have that from Tampa all the way north. I got 1,440 minutes a day, 440 of those minutes, roughly, on average. I'm sleeping at the gym, whatever, hanging out with your spouse, kids. So I got a thousand minutes to be productive. How do I use those minutes as, as dollars? So I wake up every day, I'm the CEO of my own bank of time. I got a thousand fresh dollars today, which helps me be really, really smart with my time. So I'm not wasting it. The mark of a level five leader is somebody that's able to eventually step out of the business and the culture is infused. What yeah. do you need to do in order to create that culture that survives yourself? The reason we do so much training is like, if you can teach someone to fish, they'll fish with you for a life. If you just give them a fish, then they're gonna say, okay, yeah, Ryan was good while he was giving me fish. As I've gotten to know you, you're a very deep and empathetic person. Is the paradox there that it's a necessary evil for you to go out and just brand the hell out of yourself? Ryan, I've been really excited to sit down and chat ever since my beautiful fiance, Jessica Markowski, one of your cast members on your new hit show, Owning Manhattan, introduced us. Welcome to the 10X Capital Podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm glad your fiance works with us so I could strong arm you into having a real estate broker on your podcast. So the show just came out a couple of weeks ago, but Sirhan just had a record month. Can you talk a little bit about the metrics and what effect has the show already had on your business? Yeah, we are, we're in growth mode. I think most companies are always in growth mode, but because we're still pretty young, we're, we're you know, just about four years old now, we're growing every single month. And, and June, leading up to the show, so the show came out on Netflix on June 28th, but I was curious to know, you know what, what, what were my entry metrics for the month leading into that type of launch, which means what's the business that we really put into contract, you know, kind of Q1, let's say Q2, even a little bit of Q4 of 2023. And so our, our total volume in terms of all activity was like 1.1 billion for the month of June alone, which for a publicly traded real estate firm is tiny. For a four-year-old startup like we are is is a lot. And it puts a lot of stress and pressure on on systems and, yeah. and support, which we're, we're working through. But for the, the month, it was about $845 million, uh, not including like all active listings and everything. And what was exciting about it for us was because we only started really expanding into new marketplaces about a year ago, is that a lot of the volume is now spread out evenly. You know, it used to just be like 90% New York City. 9% South Florida and then 1% everywhere else. But now it's kind of gone down to about 50% New York City. And then all of the other markets start to take a little bit of even share, which is great. Georgia had a great month. So it's fun. The Netflix effect since then, I think we've, our website traffic has increased by about 1900%. Follower count um, across social has grown by the hundreds of thousands. I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah. I know me personally, I went from 2 million to 2.2 million. And the engagement alone, like the engagement metrics have like all quadrupled. Like you can have great lead flow, but if the lead flow hits less than 2% of the time, that's not great lead flow. But if the lead flow starts hitting between 10 and 20% of the time, like that's great. There are instances of every single market, both with your fiance, but also with other agents who are not featured on the show. I am flooded right now with a guy just finished the show, got in his car, drove to our office in the Hamptons, knocked on the door and said, I'd like to sell my house. I think it's about $8 million. Who can do it? Melissa McGrath, a newer agent, was in the office, now has her first $7.85 million listing, all thanks to a guy who finished the show, literally got into his Ferrari, drove to our office, and said, you, you, I want to list with Sirhan. Are you that? You're that? You come do it. And then there you go. And we have that from That's Tampa fun. all the way north. So you're a great first principles thinker. How would you define what business are you in? What is Sirhan really? And what is the competitive advantage for Sirhan? If I look at like the definition for our, our holding corp, right, which is Sirhan Technologies, we are in the sales as a service business. So 
the real estate brokerage, right, is brokerage as a service. So we provide brokerage services to buyers, sellers, developers, vendors, and agents, right? We are the place they come to be able to provide their service to their, their customers. But our customer and brokerage is the agent at this point on a global scale. We then have Sell It. I didn't wear this on purpose, but we just have a lot of media today for sellit.com, which is the education side of our business, where we provide sales training as a service on a a kind of on a monthly subscription basis, on a one-to-one coaching basis, and on a B2B basis where we go in where we do the sales training for big companies like enterprise SDR sales training. Any any companies you could name? Any yeah, customers? we're working. I mean, right, I mean, IBM, J.P. Morgan, auto car dealerships in Florida. <laughs> like it's a, it's a big mix. Why are you so passionate about sales? Because if you're not selling anything, then you could invent any product you want, but you could invent it for your mom. You know, like one of my biggest clients of all time is a big tech guy. And I remember asking him uh, on his plane, like how cool it was that he had created that software. He said, I'm not in software. I'm in software sales. I could have the greatest software of all time, but if no one buys it, then yes. Is it about the product? Absolutely. You create a great product the sales will come. But if you don't know how to then sell that product, then there's tons of products out there that are probably great that you and I will never use or know because they were poorly managed or poorly sold. And they have uh, product intelligence at most major companies, right? You have huge sales forces. You have 100 people, you have 10,000 people. They have clear product intelligence on what they're selling, but they don't have clear revenue intelligence in as much as what those salespeople are able to produce, especially post-COVID. So when there used to be the sales floor of an enterprise sales team, you have your sales leader, your manager, you'd have the boards and everything. But now, like one of our major clients we're doing sales training for, their entire sales force to save money is now spread between Ireland and Alabama. The headquarters of this company is Dallas, Texas. And so it's all totally virtual because you don't have to pay as much of a base. You're just paying more incentives. But their churn has gone from like 20% to like 55% because now a virtual sales rep, there's no culture, there's nothing keeping me working for you. So how do I reduce churn for sales teams, for enterprises, for CROs? And if I can reduce churn, then I can increase their overall kind of net effective impact that these salespeople have. You've worked with thousands of people going through your programs and you've worked with a lot of beginners. What are the most common hangups that people have when they start to learn sales? How long is this podcast? I think, well, the first hang up that most people have is they don't like it. They think selling is gross. They don't, they don't like it. People, they, they feel like they're taking something from somebody. So the first thing that you do with someone who's brand new to sales, like brand new to real estate sales, let's say, is you first have to fix the mindset and fix the framework. Okay, so that's one. Once you do that and you understand that even the pharmacy is going to sell you hydrocortisone cream for your itch, right? Versus just telling you, just go home and figure it out. Then they don't understand process and that they don't understand how the process works forward to talk to somebody who's going to buy something, whether it's $5 or $500 million. They don't understand that process of working with a seller, right? What is the process of the sale? What's the structure of the sale? What are, what are the words I should be using? What kind of questions do I ask? The third thing that most people have a hard time with is we all grow up playing or watching sports, right? And so we think when there's two sides, there's a winner. And so everyone says, oh, I'm going into sales. I have to win. I make money when I win. But when you're in business sales, I'm selling my fund, I'm selling my real estate, I'm selling my insurance. You have to play for the other side to win. So we have something called CODO, C-O-D-O, which is close on day one. But something that we, we talk about that a lot is you have to, as you play for the other side to win, by default in business, then you win. If the other side wins, that means the deal got done, which means you win. And those are a couple of things. I mean, I could talk to you about sales training forever. Yeah, I think a lot of people say I could sell ice and Eskimo, but yeah. that's not really what great salespeople do. I think yeah. great salespeople inherently will not take on sales that they don't believe in. That's something that I've seen. And the opposite is true as well. The people that have produced millions and tens of millions of dollars personally have a product that I think they really believe in. Even outside of the product, they really believe in their service. 
like, listen, I sell a lot of real estate. Um, and we have clients who buy real estate that sometimes I think they shouldn't buy. But I, I, and we say that, and you're honest, you know, and you're fully upfront. If they still want to move forward with it, what are we going to do? Like park in front of your car so you can't go drive and buy that condo you really want. But I really believe in our service. Like as the technology we all use becomes more ubiquitous, like as AI now enters into all of our spaces, that one-to-one interaction between two human beings is just getting, I don't want to say stronger, it's like it, it's just getting more important because you want to automate almost everything except the decision. And that's what key executives are paid to do, which is make key decisions. I think that's what great salespeople are, are being compensated to do. It's what is my decision matrix for a large financial decision? I need somebody, not something to help me make that decision. And that's really what we do, and that's the service that we provide, and the best salespeople are then compensated for it, most times without a base salary, without any benefits. You know, they they're, they're just run butt naked through the world. To an outsider, it would seem that real estate has a commoditization where the relationship is really central with the person, but people go from one brokerage to another. How have you institutionalized service into your offering across all your agents? That's a big question. I definitely start with with culture first and foremost people don't quit jobs they quit managers and we don't have a whole lot of managers here like you're in our podcast studio at our headquarters in soho because i live here and i wanted one (laughs) but for the most part our business is fully in the cloud our agents work from their cars from their homes all over the country all over the world at this point so they can sell to anyone anywhere on any device at any time but understanding that that culture and having them say to themselves, yeah, but working at Sirhan is fun. Yes, but working at Sirhan is good for my career. I've doubled my sales flow. I've increased my client base. Sure, this place could pay me more. Sure, that place might have more X, Y, or Z, but my life is better at, at Sirhan. has been a, a big part of our, our vision at the beginning. And we do that by also not just doing things like creating single sign-on, but building Right? Building things and, and helping agents make their lives easier. One of the whole reasons I started this company was because I was a real estate agent for 12 years. Right, I did Million Dollar Listing New York on Bravo for 10 years and all the spinoffs. And I went to every other real estate brokerage under the sun and said, I have a team of 65. We do a billion a year. This is 2017. I think I should switch firms. I don't know why. I just I, It's that time. What are you going to do for me and how do you see your support in 2030? Like no one knew how to answer either of those questions. And so I really blame every other real estate brokerage for making me do this <laughs> because then I just I was forced to go and, and, and start this company and, and build things like simple, you know, and enable agents to buy all their time back and redefine the way that they work. And I think that also creates stickiness and helps us provide the product of helping people buy and sell homes at kind of mass scale in a way that other firms aren't able to. I've seen you on a million dollar listing. You really seem to love the the craft of selling and closing. Do you miss that? Do you miss kind of being on the ground and, and getting deals done and taking on more of a managerial and a CEO role? Yep. hundred percent. And how do you how do you balance that and how do you how do you make sure that you know you, you still have that in your life? I do a pretty bad job at it. It's one of my goals now, now that I turned forty last week, to to focus a bit more on the things that I'm really good at. It's hard when you're starting a company. You have to wear all the hats. I was the top selling broker, plus the CEO, plus the president, plus the COO, plus running finance, plus being the direct report for everybody. Like, you know, that's, but that's the job I signed up for. Um, and then I just complain about it all day long, you know, and lose sleep and stress out and work seven days a week. So we're at the point now where I'm able to say, okay, I am the, best at sales. I think that's really important for brand, for culture, for revenue. I'm the best at leading, so I'll continue to do that as CEO. And then I brand and expand all day long. Everything else, I would probably say I'm not the absolute best at, and I don't have that domain expertise. So let's go find the right people, put them in the right seats to get us the right results. And I don't want to go out there and pretend to be somebody I'm not, right? Um, and so that's that's been a big effort as to what we've been doing. So, so that way I can also buy my time back so I can sell more, so I can be in more pitches, so I can 
do what I do best, which is why you do see me selling on Owning Manhattan on Netflix. Like there are, it's not a lot, um, but there are a handful of scenes that like were very nostalgic for me to watch because it felt like old school, million dollar listing New York days, like doing a deal in the back of a car, sitting there in pressure, you know, putting the phone on mute and saying, God, we gotta put this together. Like those are, you know, I'm, I'm passionate about that and I can do it well. And so I wanna do more of it. A lot of people ask me, how much of the show is real? Way too much. I, I wish we had scripted that out. I mean, you can ask your fiance, dude, they did that podcast here in real time and yeah. it blew up in everyone's face in real time. What I thought owning Manhattan was gonna become was not what it ended up becoming because Netflix was really, really, they were intense with us. And they said, this isn't gonna be a year long shoot where you have story meetings and we go, you know, we're, cause we're not shooting an episodic. We're gonna make an eight part occupational docu-series. Mm-hmm. And the people who want to see the real estate space, they are going to binge it. Um, and that's what you need to go create. So, so you think about the production of television then in a different way where you're not thinking about commercial breaks. You're thinking about um, hooks and cliffhangers. And you're thinking about a through line of a storyline instead of this episode, we're solving this case. and this episode, we're solving this case. There's only so much of that you can watch. And so it all happened in real time. If it were up to me, everything would have sold. <laughs> But it, no. it didn't. If it were up to me, you know, Jessica would not have been in this room with Jonathan while he was bad-mouthing the entire company publicly and then putting it out on the internet for everyone to hear. That I don't think I would have scripted it that way, right? would have protected her more. But just just to play room. devil's advocate on that, do you think Jonathan has really contributed to the, to the uh, show and to the success of the show? Yep, 100%. Yeah, I think... You know, um, and I think people see that too, you know, for as many people probably gave me, and I think I even said this up to him when, when I was letting him go, like, I, I, I had a lot of strife in the hire of bringing him on. Um, cause I, I get a lot of pushback when we bring on newer agents, we bring on disruptive agents or yeah. people that maybe don't fit the culture necessarily. But I, I also see a little bit of myself in everyone, you know, a little bit of an outsider, someone who thinks differently. He's up at 4 a.m. in the gym like I am every day. Like he's wor- he's trying to get things done. And I really like that. And I, I, my vision for him was really to go from from bad to good, you yeah. know, kind of the opposite Character. of breaking bad. Yeah. I was like, you have probably 30 seconds to change someone's mind about you when you meet them. That's kind of awesome. Most people show up and they say, okay, that's a guy. That's a girl. I've made no, they've made no impression on me. So I got to go create one. You make an immediate impression. It's a niche. Yeah. And which is great. You know, I think that's, uh, that's a superpower. I just wish he had, had gone in, in the opposite way. And, and I've seen it's good TV, right? Yeah, Chloe, great. good TV. Your wife, good TV. Yeah. Jade, good TV. I mean, the, the whole cast, I think the reason the show has performed so well is not just because of the real estate. And it's not just because of me. And it's not because it's New York. From all the feedback we're getting, both from Netflix and all the reviews and all the social and all that stuff, is it's really like people have picked their love it or hate it cast members. And they're really drawn into those specific stories. And the cast is so unique and so diverse and so different that everybody can watch it. Because you're not just getting, oh, that's the show with X. And that only works for people that like X. It's like, oh, that's the show with the alphabet. <laughs> and so, yeah. okay, I'm going to go watch that because I really want to follow her journey or his journey. And I think that's why it's been so globally well-received. Yeah, an incredible production as well. Incre- it's like I'm watching a movie. Yeah, thanks, Sir Hans Studios. Hats off to uh, the crew filming this right now. Um, they were thanked at the end of those episodes, which was wild even for us. Like Netflix came to us as they were filming and doing stuff. They're like, instead of us trying to figure out how to shoot Manhattan and shoot real estate and drone through the canyons of New York City, can we just bring on Sir Hans Studios to do a lot of that? We're like, yes, sure which I think was really, really cool for our team, which is mostly young, you know, on the, on the content side, it, mostly young and they move really, really quickly. And yeah, it was, it was fun. I think the, the city as a character, even this building as a character on the show came across really, really, really beautifully. And it's a TV show. It's got to be visually appealing. So going back to, you see, you have this superpower of being able to see potential in people. You see it all over the show and you're oftentimes disappointed uh, tell me about that. And does that hurt over the many years of constantly going through the cycle and, you know, people not appreciating 
your your faith in them? <laughs> Have gratitude, God damn it. Um, I I don't know what it is. Like I, it's kind of what I said. Like I I know what I'm good at, and I know what I'm not good at. I'm a much better leader than I am a manager. I'm actually a pretty terrible manager. Like I was a few minutes late to this because I had to do my 90 day review for somebody upstairs. And I'm like, I, I don't know, just do your damn job. <laughs> just, yeah. And I will empower you and I will lead you to do it really, really well. But I don't want to be, I'm not like, I'm not the guy to sit here and talk to you about, you know, how we can improve, improve your KPIs. Like that's just, that's not me. But I do like finding good talent, kind of like a head coach or a, a general manager of a NFL team. You know, it's something I, I don't want to anger anybody, but I grew up outside Boston and I grew up watching the Patriots go from Drew Bledsoe in that game against the Jets through the Patriots era and watch them win all those championships with different players for the most part every single time. Like in in one of them, you have Chris Hogan, who was a national lacrosse player who they found, brought him in, made him a wide receiver, and then they're good. Okay, they win. And so I think it's about figuring out, okay, we're all here to win. What's the game we're looking to win? And then I need the right players. And I got to make sure that we've got redundancy, coverage, and what we're, you know, taking care of our people as we go and training them. You know, I think training and the reason we do so much training is like if you can teach someone to fish, they'll fish with you for a life. All right? If you just give them a fish, then they're going to say, okay, yeah, Ryan was good while he was giving me fish. And then he got busy and stopped giving me fish. But this company's going to give me fish. And then you kind of set up this instance of, Oh, when there's deal flow, I'll stay at that company. But when there's not, and we really, really harp on, you're going to come here to build deal flow. And then it's going to be hard to, like, why would you go anywhere else? This is where the deal flow is. Speaking of development, I look at Sirhant as, in many ways, a tech company, and I see you as a tech CEO in hyper growth. Mm -hmm. And one thing that's difficult is scaling your team. You've got some incredible people like CTO Coin, uh, Josh, your president. How do you even know who to hire to get to the next level. Talk to me about scaling and hyper growth. I can hire people to do everything but hire people. And it's become something I've had to really, really learn how to do. I am uh, a big believer in homework, right? Like you've got to show me that you can do the job and not just tell me and not just have other people tell me you can do the job. We use personality tests pretty heavily. We use Which ones? Uh, uh, we use Wimbush. We've just always had really, really good success with them. And so, you know, that also tests for memory too, right? We test for memory, we test for personality. And that also helps me understand where they're going to fit within culture. And you can know what type of person I am. And you got to do it for yourself too. Yeah. So you take a Wimbush test. And I have I a user it. manual on myself that the company created. Yeah. It's so, like the key to, to the key to interacting with me. Exactly. It's pretty well. I have the, you know, I have the same thing so that people can understand, ah, this is, so when I do what Ryan tells me to do, he's still going to get irritated, <laughs> kind of, but here's why. And you got to understand that based on everybody else. And then we use different types of you know, systems to help us hire the right people to fit the team. Like we, it is, it is a, a sports team. And you have the, the owner, head coach, the general manager. You have all the other assistant coaches down to all the players. You need all of them to win the games. But they're all hyper specific in what they do. And so, you know, our CTO, I also have known for a long time, and there's there's a loyalty and there's a trust there. Right? Josh, our president, we went out and searched for. Um, and he was somebody I never thought we could ever get. Like how, how many people did you talk to before you hired Josh? Like how, how big was this process? Ninety. It was terrible. And you <laughs> talked years. to all nineties or you're kind of yeah. homework, everything. It was hard to find somebody that could really understand what we do understand the growth and also come from a very senior level of, you know, he was president of all of Keller Williams. I mean, that's yeah. 180,000 agents based in Texas. We were here in New York. When I first started talking to him, we were 300 people. Like, why would you want to do that? Unless you think there's a multi-billion dollar idea, right? Unless you say that, okay, this is the next thing on, on my list. I went from here to here to here. You know, no one wants to make a lateral move, especially employees, because you don't have to explain it down the line. I think when you have the right culture and the right vision and then the right team, it's like Tom Brady going to Tampa Bay. Like, what? But clearly he saw something that said, mm -hmm, that's the championship team. I'm going to add my ingredient into it, and we're going to do it. And he did it that year. Fucking crazy. 
And so I saw hiring people, right, especially on, on the technology side. I love a good outsource and I love variable costs, you know, especially with developers. Like I look at what some of our, our competitors have done and they bring so much on the books and they have incredible payroll because I feel like people think that quantity means something. I think when people ask you how big is your company, you have three hundred employees. They don't ask necessarily how, how how much revenue do you have. Exactly, I, it's more I mean, of a personal question. I think because I'm a salesperson, like, I want to do a billion a year as a salesperson of one. All the salespeople that I have to have to be able to do all of those sales means less revenue, and now I got to manage all these people. I want to have the leanest, most efficient team I possibly can. If I can build a massive company with as few people as possible, which is why. AI is so important for us and everything that we do here. It, it just increases the value of all the people who are here. And then allows you to scale your support yep. support by, by salesperson. You yeah, clearly are, are, are a great leader, but the mark of a level five leader is somebody that's able to eventually step out of the business and the culture is infused. What yeah. do you need to do in order to create that culture that survives yourself? I read from good to great as well, and that, that level <laughs> five leader. It's an incredibly rare leader. Yes. I don't know if I'm a level five leader because that level five leader isn't doing press about themselves all day. That's, <laughs> I think, literally the difference between level four and level five is level five is company first, you know, man or woman second, you know, personality mm -hmm. second. And unfortunately, like, we are a brand and a business based on attention. Like 10 years ago, I think I, I made the realization that the product in sales used to be your skill set because that's how you get business. Because people would say, hey, David, who sold your place? He did a good job. Oh, I'm going to go hire them. Mm -hmm. that, that was it. Okay, Your product was your skill set. Today, your product is attention. And if you can match attention with skill set, then you win and you actually beat the person with a better skill set. Like, Which goes back to your engagement of your followers. It's not just you grew by 10%, but you grew by four times engagement. You're, correct. you're more, you're more uh, center of mind. Yeah. Right. So anyway, I'm trying to be a level five leader. Eventually, we'll get us to a point where this Ryan of Sirhant, which we're doing a little bit now, can step out and that the brand can stand on its own outside of the guy. So when we first met six months ago, I went to your office and I saw like 50 pictures of you. I've never seen that in a business office. And I'm like, wow, this guy's really into himself. But as I've, got, as, I've gotten, as I've gotten to know you, you're a very deep and empathetic person. Is the paradox there that it's a necessary evil for you to go out and just brand the hell out of yourself? Like dissect that, that, that contradiction in your personality. Yeah, our, my personal brand and therefore our company band brand is, is what drives revenue, right? It's what drives recruitment. You just embraced it, essentially. Yeah, it, it's what drives recruitment, retention, and revenue, right? The three R's. Like, if, if, if that's what's going to make it happen, and that's also what's going to inspire people. So the reason my photo is everywhere here <laughs> is because the agents... It's a great who, photo, by the way. The agents who join the company and come here to our headquarters almost kind of come into this space a little bit like a museum, Right. Every moment is a place to take photos. It's a little bit of a, an homage to the last 15 years of my life, like be in the room where it happened. Here it is. And also here's some history. Here's the reason why you're coming here, because Ryan sold this or he did that. And there's photos of other people too. If the personal brand is what drives the attention, which is the product, which brings in the business to allow you to retain so that you can get the revenue, then I have to own it. Like, I would be an idiot. Did you ever, it. for a second, consider uh, having a neutral name and not yes. Sir Hunt? Yeah, I tried. I tried. I pushed for one. I agree with the decision that we ended up making, which yeah. was calling it Sir Hunt with a period. Um, but I really tried to call the company, like, sunflower.com. We had other names, man. I tr because I was like, what if something happens to me? What if yeah. I do something dumb? And then the it, does, it does hold you to a higher accountability, your name on it. Yeah. I've, I've talked to people with their names like it, it's a different level of commitment. Yeah. You, listen, you see it in the show. You see it in my conversations with a lot of the agents. Like, Leads you, to better decision making on personnel. Yeah. Like you, if, if I owned a company that had a different name other than myself, would I care as much? Yes, probably. But when they're running around saying, hey, I'm so-and-so with Sirhant and not, hey, I'm so-and-so with 
gpsrealty.com, forever the reputation is set with that one sentence. And so I think we probably, from all of our competitors, have the highest reputational standards because it's always going to be Sirhan hired or Sirhan fired, right? Not X and X with company where Ryan Sirhan is the CEO. It's just a much easier. There's no backing out of uh, when it's your name's on the building. Yeah, no. You wear many hats, and I consider you a branding genius. Tell me about what, what is a brand fundamentally, and how should businesses, maybe LPs, venture capitalists, think about building their brand? So a brand is reputation, right? If you think about the math, I mean, there's two types of brands. There's personal brands, and there's product brands. You know, there's like Phil Knight, and then there's Nike. So um, if we start with personal first, you've got core identity. So who am I? That's, most people don't know. Most people have no idea. Like define yourself without using your name and try not to just talk about your job. That's weird for people. They have is a hard that a time principles thing or what, what is core identity? It, 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 honestly, it depends. I think the easiest way for us to think about it, especially when we're talking to salespeople, okay, is say, okay, you are what you do and who you are. So what, what is your and? You could have 100 ands or try to pick one. Try to pick two, because there are riches and niches. Maybe your and is social media. Like my and for a long time has been media. It's what we get hired for. It's why people come to this company. It's how we generate revenue. I mean, it's it's everything, right? People come to us and say, well, I could go everywhere else, but media sells. And if people aren't building media companies that I don't know what they're really building, and we are a media company that sells real estate. Um, so that's my that's my and, and people have to figure it out. Maybe your and is tattoos. Maybe your and is kids. Maybe your and is kayaking or cooking. So really figure out what that core identity is. Figure out how to define yourself without using your name. Then you've got creating consistent awareness. So that's consistent content. That's doing a podcast and staying consistent at it. It's social. It's LinkedIn. It's blogging. It's personal emails. Maybe your thing is in-person events. You do a dinner once a month, but you're consistent. And then part three to that math is creating what I like to call like shouting it from the mountaintop. No one cares about your successes more than you do. So people have to know about them. Kind of going back to the original product, product being skill set. Like you got to let people know that you are skilled to match today's product, which is attention. So the skill set doesn't go away. It's just it's 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 transferred differently to your audience. And if you know your audience and you know your target market, and you know that community then you can start to really, really commoditize it, right, and, and build it. On a product, we, we try to always turn products into people. So, okay, 10x capital. Is it you or is it is it really like who is that target? Who's the person? 10x is Bob. Who's the car customer? It's Bob. Yeah. It's Sally. What does she look like? What's her social media account look like? What is her core identity? If she was creating content awareness, what would it be? Right? And how would Sally be amplifying her message? And you got to do that same math to then go out and build the reputation. That way you can control your brand because everybody has a brand whether they like it or not. They're either just in control of it or they're not. You live by this thousand minute rule. Tell me about that and how has that evolved over time? The thousand minute rule. I get flack for this. I appreciate you bringing it up. As an entrepreneur, no one tells me what to do every day. I have clients who say you got to be here by this time, but that, like, other than that, I wake up and have to make my own life happen. I was trying to figure out a way to to manage my time. Like, what do I do? And so I started with just kind of creating what I call finder keeper doer, which was helpful for me to say every day I'm going to find business, keep business, do business. I'm going to CEO, COO, CFO every day. I got to wear all three hats. So from eight to 10, I'm going to find business from 10 to 12. I'm going to keep the business I have. And then from 12 to five, I'm going to go and do everything I got to do. Right. And that kind of morphed into saying, I got 1,440 minutes a day, 440 of those minutes, roughly on average, I'm sleeping yeah. at the gym, whatever, hanging out with your spouse, kids. So I got a thousand minutes to be productive. And how do I use those minutes as, as dollars? So I wake up every day. I'm the CEO of my own bank of time. I got a thousand fresh dollars today, which helps me be really, really smart with my time. So I'm not wasting it because being wasteful with your time, as I've met more and more successful people in my life, is probably one of the clear things they think about and operate on. And then also helps me with like bad days or bad phone calls because it used to be, you know, someone would be mad for 10 minutes. I just ruined my day. That just ruined, you ruined my day. You ruined my week. Oh, that was, you know, 
and now I'm throwing out $990 because you took 10 of them? Congratulations, 10X Capital Podcast listeners. We have officially cracked the top 10 rankings in the United States for investing. Please help this podcast continue climbing up in the rankings by clicking the follow button above. This helps our podcast rank higher, which brings more revenue to the show and helps us bring in the very highest quality guests and to produce the very highest quality content. Thank you for your support. We saw on the show you lost a large listing. How do you recover from that very quickly? Like, what's your best practice? Do you do yoga? Do you do meditation? Or do you think a guy with a thousand minute rule does <laughs> yoga? Do you think I have time to do yoga? No, uh, I wish I did yoga. Um, I very specifically, I started doing this a long time ago. It's like evolutionary. We are not built to remember pain. We're built to remember pleasure, right? That's why we have kids. And we got to repopulate the earth as much as we can. So you don't remember pain. Otherwise, you wouldn't get on that bike because you fell off that time and scraped your elbows. You, you're, you would literally remember the pain you had on your elbows and not just remember that you fell and that there was discomfort. You'd never get back on the bike. To get over those times, I wanted to figure out how do I create muscle memory for getting over tough times? How can I be tougher than the tough times? And I literally go into my calendar 30 days out, like if this was a terrible meeting, something mm -hmm. I hate, you just killed a deal for me. I would go into my calendar 30 days from today at this exact same time and I'd just say, open me. And I would type them out how much I hate you, <laughs> like how much this sucks and this deal and this, and I just unload in that calendar invite. And then what happens is 30 days goes on, right? And then I wake up and I come to that day and I see that calendar invite. I'm like, oh, damn it. And I open it and I feel one of a couple things. One, now I don't care anymore because it's been a month. Two, oh, I fixed it. Oh, that deal did go through or I fixed that problem. Or three, oh, it's still a problem. I got to take care of it, right? It's one, of, it's one of those three, but now I have new sites on it and, it. and so now what happens is anytime that thing happens, like if you watch the show, I think in the first episode, I feel like I'm about to do a 200 plus million dollar deal and the broker calls me and says, nope. And for a split second, I literally turn to this wall in the Empire State Building and put my face on it and just hug the wall for a split second. And what I'm really doing in that moment is making a mental note, this bad thing just happened, which is telling my brain, you're gonna get over it. Because one of the best pieces of advice I also got getting into sales, which is a roller coaster of a life, right? Yeah. You're up and you're down, you're up and you're down, um, is this too shall pass. And bad days come and go. And so do good days. That great deal you did, it's only as good as, 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 as far as the time you did it. And you're only as good as your last deal. You're only as good as your 1099 in this business. I think it also helps, personally, I found surrounding yourself with level-headed people. I have, I have Curtis here, you know, I go through these- He's super level-headed, he, he literally hasn't moved yeah. this whole time. These, these ups and downs, and then Curtis is like, well, we have 75 LPs, we have this and this, and I'm like, yeah, that's right. Like, no, nothing really changed from the last meeting, but, but having that is like a nice way to, yeah. to do that. It's, it's you, anxiety too, not to cut you off, but like one of, one of the exercises they teach you if you have panic attacks is first you have to sit, so you have to relax your diaphragm. And then you get a pen and paper, old school style. And you, on the left side of the paper, you write down everything that's bad in your life. What is the panic from? Just you go through all of it. And then you do a big line. And then on the right side of the paper, you write down everything that's good in your life. And when you do it right, 99.9% .9 of the time, the right side of the paper is much longer. And you just have to be honest with yourself that way. And by then you've caught your breath, you've calmed down and you realize like what Curtis does for you. Oh, right. Things are great. And my worst day is her greatest day of all time. It's like that meme where you Absolutely. see the guy in a car. He's like, I hate my car. And then the person next to him in a bike who's like, I wish I had a car. And then the person waiting for the bus is like, I wish I had a bike. And the person walking by is like, I wish I had money to afford a bus. Absolutely. And speaking of slowing down, you've built these like three businesses how do you make the decision on whether to go wide and deep? And do you ever think I need to take two steps back so I could go for that $10 billion, $1 billion development? Like, how do you look at what challenges to take on and when to go forward, when to go back and plan? I mean, I made a decision a long time ago that sales, that's kind of why we started this conversation, but we're, you know, sales as a service, sales is our oak tree. 
and we can go build a forest of those oak trees. I'm not, I'm probably not going to have this similar success rate if I go and try to make an apple orchard, you know, or an orange tree farm. Like I have oak trees. Those oak trees can then have branches or I can have other oak trees. And so like along the lines of like the tech, right? So like building simple, which is AI powered back office support for salespeople to buy all their time back. And I can empower humans. It's really what it does. So I can take a human support person who with our competition can handle four to five salespeople a day. And using Sirhan Simple, one human support person can handle between 100 and 120 salespeople a day because we've taken all of the tasks custom based on the individual salesperson and we've automated them using recipes. That is right now a pretty big branch of our oak tree but will soon become a separate oak tree in the same forest, right? Kind of underneath our hold co. Um, but Your I wouldn't core go out. identity as a sales organization Correct. will never change. Correct. And which, which also stops me from making decisions that'll be a distraction. You know, it's like the Steve Jobs quote where he says, is this issue a focus? Like, I don't want to be distracted by trying to create a line of shoes just because I could. It's not, it's not what I do. I don't even have that many shoes. I think it becomes hard to focus if you don't have that core core focus. Yeah. If you don't have that core identity, you're always kind of like the dog chasing yeah. the next car. Yeah, you got to know you got to know what you want. Like, what do you want? Can you define the difference in your own life between what makes you happy and what makes you joyful? Like, are you trying to be satisfied or are you trying to be content? How do you define success? Like, these are big questions that I think most people should try to answer because it'll help them with their own vision. You know, from myself to you, to Curtis, to Danny, what is that? And when you can answer those big questions, it just really, really helps that decision tree for everything else in your life. What restaurant to go to, this, 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 you know? My mentor, Eric Anderson, taught me this concept of building your last business. What business do you wanna work in the next 30, 40 years? and then go about building that. And then that, that leads to kind of uh, work-life balance and, and happiness in life. Mm-hmm. Uh, so on that note, uh, I really appreciate you jumping on the podcast. Uh, obviously, I binged. I woke up at 3 a.m. to watch the show with I Jessica. Heard. I heard. Uh, and we binged through that. And She's uh, great, man. So she comes across so great on camera. I love that she has um, an arc as well. Yeah. You know, kind of starts, gets in the middle of it, which is, listen, it's a reality TV show, and then comes out strong. And I think the future the future is super bright. And then you get people that root for you. Like you don't want to be one note. Yeah. Yeah. And she's really evolved and I really appreciate your, your faith in her as well. And uh, thanks for jumping on the podcast. Thanks, man. For more ideas on how to raise venture capital in this market, make sure to subscribe below.